Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I know it's really early for you. You have your coffee or java or green tea or whatever. <laughs> I do have my I'm an Earl Grey gal. Ah, okay. I'll remember Hi, that. Fabian, I think you're muted. I'll unmute you. There you go. Perfect. I think you will be good now. Perfect. So, Tammy, meet Fabian. Nice to meet Fabian, you. meet Tammy. <laughs> nice to meet you, Fabian. You're in Argentina? Yes. By the way, you look very um, very similar to, to a friend of mine that she was a colleague in the doctoral program that I am studying right now, that, and her name is Nati Ceruti. I, I don't know if you have a... Uh, heard about her not yet um, not yet yeah she is very immersed into transforming education following the uh, Finland model so she is uh, traveling inside the provinces and training thousands of uh, k-12 teachers and infusing the Finnish spirit into their teaching and all the methods and, and the mindsets yes Yes. Boots on the ground for transformation. That's amazing. <laughs> yes. That's it. <laughs> That's yeah. it. And she has the same kind of uh, color mix in, in, in her hairdo as yours. So. <laughs> well, I come by it honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I came by mine honestly too. <laughs> yeah, sure. We are, we're all being honest ourselves. So, yes. yeah. so we, we walk our talk, right? <laughs> Do our best to. I mean, when you press record, it becomes a lot easier to walk your talk because you can see yourself not doing that. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, can I, I just wanted to ask sort of, could you share your sort of, you know, vision and um, for this conversation and dialogue um, and, you know, what the, what the um, uh, allocation is, I, because you had alluded to in your original reach out, you'd sort of alluded to uh, multiple sessions and which we're game for and could absolutely use. But I, I wanted to sort of, if we could have a sense of that, then we know better how to, how to sort of share. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, first of all, I'll start by saying thank you both so much for taking your time to come and, and meet. Uh, I did have the opportunity yesterday to watch our session from yesterday. Um, and so yeah. it's, I, I just want to say, Doug, how much I appreciate you come from a place of, of uh, deeply authentic and conscious selfhood. Uh, and I, I just really honor that um, to start off with. And I, am, I love that this work does take people working in alignment and working together. And it sounds like you guys have really found good ways to be able to collaborate and connect. So I'm personally really excited to hear not only about your work, but about your collaboration. Um, and in terms of uh, in terms of of this process, it's what we decide. It's totally co-created by us. Perfect. Um, so this here is I'm recording now. Um, my philosophy is any media that I create with anyone uh, is a representation of their of their voice, their image, their identity. And therefore, you have absolute agency around what happens to this media after the fact. Uh, and, and in fact, I think that's one of the core underlying shifts that I think that we need to um, understand the consequences of in terms of uh, creating media that we choose to make um, as a documentation of the types of collaborations that we feel can help to shift things. Uh, so that's to say that uh, that whatever we do, um, both in the conception of and the living through as we are uh, documenting, uh, is up to us in the moment, prior, and afterwards. So uh, that's the basis. Uh, my intention is to uh, is to 
uh, follow the process according to what you guys need. I would love to do three parts. It may, but this is a new experiment having um, two people who, um, uh, having two people, um, how you're, you're connected. Uh, and I actually really prefer what it is when there is a third point of perspective in any conversation. So I also love that. Um, so it may be that this, that this takes four or 17. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, but that's up to us. And I'm happy to invest uh, my time and, and you guys will do the same. So we've got our sweat equity and what this is. Uh, and the, the intention is really to explore each other's work from a very human perspective, taking into consideration the um, state of affairs that we're in both globally as well as in our own personal lives. Uh, and the, the, including the passions and the tensions and, and, tensions and the challenges uh, and our ways of knowing and being that can help us to uh, model and exemplify the kinds of practices that can help to support broad collaboration. So that's my little mini channel at the beginning. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to sort of um, acknowledge you for the same. Um, uh, your clarity, intention, generosity in um, your time and attention and the intelligence behind your time and attention um, is really affective and powerful and um, impressive and I, I actually, I shared with Fabian that for the longest time I was invoking you and I, and I kept having a blank on your first name. And I only have blanks on, on names like that um, when usually when there's like an issue. Not about you, about me. And, and um, I realized that I sort of am, I'm a little bit, jealous and intimidated at your um, your clarity and efficiency of sort of connecting dots and translating sharing and moving conversation forward and it's it's a really concentrated powerful skill set and talent um, and uh, so I, I just want to acknowledge you for that. Um, I, Fabian's at a little bit of a disadvantage. I've had more consumption of your uh, past work and videos. So, um. <laughs> well, but, but uh, thank you. Uh, if I have to uh, share my opinion on the emergence, uh, I would also thank you, Tommy, for welcoming us and being able to share and to co-construct meaning in this conversation. And we are absolutely advocating this kind of generative conversations in, a, in this field that we are proposing as being a generativity field that we are trying to start building and uh, organically uh, nurture in order to be expanding slowly um, who knows where it can be scaled Yes. And how. So we are just in the first baby steps of that. And even we are coining new, new words, etc. So we can better communicate people about the new. And we are also have been living an unlearning process from the industrial mindset. And we are like always being iconoclasts to <laughs> people's opinions. But when they say, okay, we are full of love and we are conscious, etc. But let's punish people financially and let's punish. So 
<laughs> so I, I find that kind of, um, let's say, funny <laughs> for being polite. And uh, then I, I share my thoughts with them. Well, if you pretend to, to come from a place of consciousness, why are you reacting like that and proposing that kind of punishment? Uh, you would prefer coming from a place of compassion rather than of uh, wanting to punish people for that. So how would you do uh, that uh, paradigm shift? It's not easy, of course. Uh, that is one of the most difficult things to, to implement, to enact, and to bootstrap oneself uh, into that paradigm shift. And um, Doug and, and I took the last almost three years and learning ourselves, the industrial, and I am like the, the guardian when, when I find tiny, tiny traces of that industrial mindset in Doug's uh, soliloquiums, then I, uh, I usually stop him and I, hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> and I, I do the reverse. I do the yeah. same. So yeah. we keep each other, we keep, keep each other on the tracks. It's, uh, well, it's so embedded right? Like it's embedded in our language. It's embedded in our, in everything we do. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it is, I'm really looking forward to hearing how, you know, those points of how the unlearning, like where, cause it's, it's really specific. It's this word in this situation where you were like, aha, oh my gosh, this was yeah. the old way. Um, what, you know, and feel into that new. I just want to feed back, uh, Fabian, one thing. Um, we're not trying to do this. We are doing this. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yes. Um, just the, when you said it, 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 and, you know, I have been in a place in my own practice where I've been saying try for myself as well. And mm -hmm. so it's like this, this ownership of actually, no, I'm 100% here. And I... Um, I know I can't change it all by myself, but I can change myself such that I can meet others and actually look at how we can change our personal behavior and create some um, interventions and, pup and protocols and practices that can help us to guide ourselves through this transition. So anyway. Thank you for the feedback. And uh, maybe this, this is part of my personality. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of humble and low profile, <laughs> so it permeates some of my communication. So I always understate and over deliver. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in it's great to do some context setting pieces right at the beginning. Um, so and to get to know a little bit about each of your stories. So uh, Fabian, I know the least about you and I'm wondering if yeah. you can just share a little bit about your journey and what brought you to this work as well as to Doug. So however way that, that flows. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, uh, I have lived several lives in my life. And um, I started as a um, lifelong learner since I was six. I swallowed two encyclopedias uh, when I was six years old. So uh, one had 20 volumes, the other had 12 volumes. So I was like a little pro prodigy in that sense. <laughs> of course, there were others, other aspects of my personality that weren't so brilliant, but, <laughs> but at that time I was, yes, I was like a sponge uh, for absorbing information and knowledge, etc. So uh, from then uh, I started to learn more formally and um, more or less till the mid 80s. And then I discovered uh, that there was something called entrepreneurship. So I decided to invest energy in that and uh, took a workshop on entrepreneurship and I subscribed to the entrepreneur magazine etc and serendipitously I discovered that in MIT there were some people that were training managers using management flight simulators 
So I asked for a sample disk of one of the simulations that was around uh, an air company called People Express that was a famous Harvard business case of a low cost airline and that uh, the people playing the role of general managers of that company in that simulation, they had to decide three or four variables only and see the outcomes of that and plan their strategies. So they sent, uh, and that communication, uh, I did it by fax at that moment. So <laughs> it was like 93. Oh, uh, I cannot- Sorry, I was muted, but yes. I, I try and limit the amount of interpenetrative sound, but yeah, yes. I, that's what I was curious about, the year. Yes, uh, it was 93. So uh, they sent me the disc together with four pounds of academic articles and papers. So <laughs> there was a field that underlied those management simulations and that field was system dynamics and system thinking. So I started there to learn about that uh, as a self-managed, self-organized uh, person. And I became like a local expert in, in that field. And I also uh, had the feeling that uh, I wanted to learn more about that. So I attended a master's program in Norway, in Bergen, uh, of system dynamics. And while I was there studying, uh, I used to interact in an education social network around system dynamics in education. So uh, I was invited to go in uh, close to Christmas. So I uh, traveled from Norway to San Antonio, Texas, and I worked uh, for free like 10 days and I interacted with people uh, that were implementing a learning organization education project. And so I went uh, back to Norway and after that, I started to negotiate in order to uh, be considered for collaborating in that initiative. And of course I was accepted. <laughs> and uh, I went there and I spent a whole year uh, helping uh, like 12 different schools. And uh, I also worked in UTSA, that is the University of Texas and San Antonio. And I helped even guys that were in probation uh, of high school age. So I worked with all the stakeholders in the education uh, constellation. And, uh, yes. So what, what was the project exactly? Well, it, the, in, the intention of, of the project was uh, help the educational system of uh, 15 schools of Texas State to become learning organizations. So, uh, and I was like the leg uh, of system thinking and system dynamics of that project. Uh, there were people that were experts in the other disciplines from Peter Senge's uh, book. Uh, at that time, uh, it was like the bestseller and, and like the source of system thinking and, and also system dynamics somehow. And um, then I, I uh, flew back to Buenos Aires and uh, I integrated uh, a school of engineering where I was uh, in charge of the System Dynamics Center. So I, I have been director of that center for 10 years. And I started to interact with the System Dynamics International Community and also the Latin American community of System Dynamics. Then afterwards, uh, my, my uh, field of interest onion started to grow. So I became a facilitator and I learned some uh, action reflection learning coaching. And then I was an expert in balance scorecard. And then I learned innovation with an Israeli company. And then that, that is called SIT. Uh, that they do systematic inventive thinking uh, as a methodology that they have invented, derived from uh, TREES, that is another largest systematic inventive thinking methodology. And afterwards, I learned design thinking. And so uh, currently, I am uh, teaching design thinking and system thinking in corporations and in the academic field. And, 
also uh, design thinking as well. Um, I am now a student of a new doctoral program at the same school of engineering uh, called leadership and systemic innovation. So the systemic innovation field itself is still being defined. There are like four definitions, four different definitions of what systemic innovation is. So, uh, and I always like to be part of the pioneers. So uh, I am part of the first cohort there, of course. <laughs> then uh, um, in 2014, uh, or uh, much before that, in, in 97, I became friend with Jim Bellinger, who was at that time the leader of the system thinking world community uh, in LinkedIn and in other uh, networks. And I am a friend of him uh, till today. And um, then he referred me to a guy in Switzerland that he wanted to build a community that was called Business Insights. And that community needed uh, some channel experts in different topics. So I became their the system thinking channel expert. And um, is there where I have uh, bumped into Doug. Uh, he was also part of the, uh, let's say, small table team that was uh, the founder of that community, then a guy that was like a COO that he is from Israel and Doug also as a polymath thinker and I as a system thinker and uh, some few creative ideas. And uh, then um, from there, uh, time passed by and Doug shared with me a vision and I bought into that vision immediately because when you are uh, doing and uh, living system thinking, um, system thinking and system doing, you become more like a world citizen and, and you want all good things to happen to the world, uh, etc. And I have been also a, a good child and a good man, so I immediately accepted that. And um, so far, uh, almost three years have uh, been uh, flowing and uh, we have started with a simple idea and that idea has been growing and evolving and being enriched and now it has um, become more uh, of a project garden as we like to define it uh, that we are going to nurture and to put some water to the garden and to embellish it but we are not going to sell anything <laughs> We and Doug is going to share th uh, that better with you uh, of defining like uh, how all the whole initiative looks like. But the kind of collaboration is very spontaneous. Uh, we meet on a daily basis from Monday to Friday. And uh, some time ago, we met like three times per week. And uh, lastly, or lately, we have been meeting uh, once per day because we want the initiative more or less at the end of this year coming in its beta form to life uh, so <laughs> we are trying we are trying <laughs> but also we are sure that we are doing things and we are inventing uh, things and we are disrupting and uh, also we are very sad about how the things uh, are evolving due to the to the old mindset or the industrial mindset that is not old, it's the current mindset. So all the types of value that is being destroyed due to the industrial mindset. And we also have expanded on the vision of what value means uh, even beyond, beyond the triple bottom line. Uh, we have defined that value can take uh, dozens of different forms, not only economic, social, and environmental, but there are many more expressions of value. It's like a multifaceted uh, diamond uh, that is uh, possible to, to define or a kaleidoscopic vision of what value means. Uh, so that is also part of the 
that we were giving to, to our creation. And then, lately, we have uh, also been thinking about the generativity space that uh, Doug is also going to share with you. Um, uh, we are just defining the how, and um, it's not going to be very uh, complicated, but uh, we are like uh, rehearsing uh, how would we welcome people that they jump into that field. And uh, we are not building on value networks or uh, networks or social networks, but we are redefining it as a field. And that is how uh, Doug will, will also expand on that. Uh, I trust he is much more detailed and talkative than that, that myself. So he is going to delve into more details about that. And um, we have thought also uh, us as uh, being catalysts, uh, not as being implementers, uh, nor helping uh, people execute or implement. And we are strong believers in self-organization. And we are also strong believers that uh, you cannot define values in the Swiss Alps carrying all the leaders there and then expecting for that never happening cascade of all those values being honored and cherished and enacted. So we don't believe that. So we have defined another process for values, definition and agreement uh, that also Doug will explain. And um, we are very happy with, with our creation. And uh, uh, so far, uh, sharing our vision with several people in different uh, uh, meetings and uh, informal talks, etc. cetera, uh, people are really uh, understanding. Uh, they, are, they are asking, well, I want to see more. <laughs> so uh, there are, of course, some people that uh, they ask more the uh, tiny bitty uh, details of, of the process. Uh, they don't understand that the process is going to be defined by the same organization. We are not going to impose any any process. Uh, so people are used to uh, being imposed models and processes and uh, prescriptive stuff that they have to do, but we don't believe in that. <laughs> so I don't know, uh, Doug, if you want to uh, take now the talking stick and uh, <laughs> share some thoughts. Sure. So you can expand on mine and uh, infuse yours. Sure. I'm going to mute my mic. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, my journey, uh, I'm a New York City kid. Uh, and, um, and so my journey um, really started with um, being being an ADD kid before ADD was defined or put out in the world, um, but um, what ADD actually is isn't a lack of um, in in from a intention and awareness or understanding. Um, what ADD is, is sort of the executive function doesn't happen until like 55. <laughs> and one of the effects of that, um, because generally ADD people tend to be pretty smart, um, is that uh, in the face of not having something that uh, assists with figuring out what's important and what isn't, um, they sort of, relate to everything is important. <laughs> um, so it becomes an indiscriminate like um, orientation toward attention. So uh, so I've I've always been a a polymath thinker, um, sort of huge breadth and scope, not necessarily a lot of depth. Uh, in any one area, but a real interest in lots of areas. And can you um, can you just define polymath? Sure. I and and by the way, I only came to sort of 
own that mantle when somebody accused me of being one. Um, <laughs> And, and then like, I, you know, what is that? And then I actually went and looked it up, and it's just sort of like a generalist. You know, it's sort of a modern version of a Renaissance person who's broadly and widely exposed and aware and cultured and knowledgeable, um, and has nothing to do with math. <laughs> <laughs> which, which for most of my life, I didn't think I could do and didn't. And, you know, um, I, I sort of go deep there now. But um, uh, so, um, you know, one of, my, one of my partners over the years sort of tagged me as a, as a catalyst provocateur. Um, and so, and, and that's always been my handle. But, um, so uh, I went to school um, really um, not knowing or understanding the, the sort of normal curve or frame for in, in any dimension or regard, um, and uh, fell into, uh, I was one credit shy of graduation and ended up in a course with Robert Jastro at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York, which is affiliated with Columbia. And he was sort of the, the, um, the number two to uh, Carl Sagan. He never got the visibility or the press, but he was a real Carl Sagan kind of guy. Um, and, there, and he taught a course called Stars, Planets, and Life, which was sort of connecting dinosaurs to the Big Bang, which was always a big black hole. I had a quest, like, what, what, how did we get from there to there? And, um, and it was a terrific class, and it led to um, my getting a job in the geography department, working in the Satellite Remote Sensing Data Analysis Group at Goddard, um, not that I was anywhere near qualified to be doing there, what I was doing there, but I, you know, um, I ended up there and spent a year and a half doing graduate work in geography. Um, except um, I'm relating to geography as a referential science, meaning something in relation to the position of something else. I'm not like grounded by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and while I was doing that, I was also doing a lot of acting. So it, it was a, it was a, a way to pay the bills and whatever. And at a certain point, I sort of shook my head and, and a family friend said, you know, why don't you go to law school? Because if you're Jewish, you know, um, you go to law school or med school. You know, if you're Christian, you go to the military. But it's sort of like, you know, there's these cultural things. And, um, and so I ended up going to law school as a not with any sort of great vision of being a lawyer, but as a continuation of a liberal arts education, if you're, if you're math enabled, you go to med school, and if you're linguistically tilted, then you law school makes sense. Um, and um, I got out of law school, and I had always, in high school, I had been heavily involved with some film production folks and projects, and, and I'd always been focused and drawn to the entertainment industry because it was the one thing on the planet where, to my eye, people paid you to pay attention. Yeah. Yes. Like for the privilege of paying attention to you. Like there was just something unbelievably powerful in that. Um, and so um, I got out of law school, I formed a production company, I hung out a shingle in entertainment law and um, uh, started in the music business because that's sort of the slot machine of the entertainment industry. You, know, you have film as the high roller room, um, television is the hundred dollar table, theater is the is the ten dollar table, and music business was the you know twenty five cents in your plan, and um, and ended up uh, generating some pretty significant success as an outsider without resources and not knowing anybody. But I ended up producing a couple of, you know, hit records and a couple of successful artists and, um, and, and did everything wrong it's possible to do in business. Awesome. So I, I, you know, blew it up. 
and then I wrote it down in a you know fiery crash and burn um, and learned a lot um, and um, came out of that um, having learned a lot about business but not a lot of self-awareness or emotional intelligence or any of that stuff. I was pretty primitive in those days and as a human being. And so I started putting what I learned to work with helping entrepreneurs and startups or early stage companies turn arounds um, over the course of a decade. This is like 90 to 2000. And um, what I kept finding was I could, one of the skills, talents that comes naturally is that if you give me a blank sheet of paper and a one line idea, um, I can see the greatest, grandest extrapolation off of that seed um, five years out and then reverse calculate how you get there and all the things that are needed to get there and what that looks like. Can I just say that's an amazing superpower? <laughs> well, you know, as the one who has it, and I recognize that I own it, but um, I don't take any credit for it. It come, comes from someplace else. So <laughs> just an aptitude. So, um, uh, so my applying that skill, what I kept finding over and over again was that the human beings on the receiving end of it usually were wholly ill-prepared and ill-equipped to see what they had wrought in terms of their initial vision. They would sort of freak out or they would get scared or they would, you know, it, it just was, and, and what that maps to, what I can say now is that maps to them actually being out of alignment internally in terms of thought, word, and action. Their words were, this is what I want to create and their you know, uh, engagement in mapping it out was, you know, this is what I want to create. But their belief was, I can't create that. <laughs> um, and so when confronted with the reality of it, um, they would sort of, you know, it was a really miserable uh, sort of uh, um, implementation success rate. And so I said, I better figure out how to also tend to the human being. The entrepreneur is human being. And now in parallel to this in my law practice, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I never had any interest in litigation, never been in a courtroom, have no interest in ever being in a courtroom. Um, in, you know, 29 years of practice, doing nothing but transaction and contract related stuff and structural stuff. I only had one contract I did ever uh, in contention adversity go to arbitration. Neat. And I only did custom work. So, um, so I started sort of learning up like Fabian's dive into systems thing, I started getting into people and me and my, I said, better start at home, like clean me up, figure out me. Um, and I had a weekend workshop uh, that was Adlerian based standalone, not generally known and um, no big organization or business or upsell. Uh, and um, was one of those folks at the extreme end of the bell curve who walked out six feet off the ground for six months, like really shook my world and came out of it and completely terraformed everything. My practice, my par a partnership at that time, everything just sort of like shut it all down. And um, over the intervening time, um, really spent a lot of time with my process and helping other people first as an assistant and, and subsequent workshops and then ultimately getting certified to teach and getting certified in redirecting children's behavior, which is sort of 
nonviolent, rational, intelligent parenting skills. And sorry, what is this body of work? Um, this is uh, redirecting children's behavior is a is a a parenting uh, program that comes out of an organization called INCAF, um, and it's sort of rational, nonviolent, intelligent. Um, I, I used to say, you know, the problem isn't with the child or the dog. Like, the problem is with the owner or the parent. <laughs> um, and so this is like recognizing that yelling at a child to stop yelling isn't rational. Like, that's not a, that's not a productive thing. <laughs> um, so uh, I really ended up sort of um, drifting more and more into working with people as a coach, as an instructor of the workshop and that work, helping, you know, helping people. And, um, and in my practice, it evolved into unlawyering, which means I would get involved either with all parties to something that was being born or new, or I would get involved with a party in a contentious situation and help them communicate with the other side around all the lawyers to neutralize the lawyers and actually arrive at something rational. It was really um, different. And at this point, my practice, from a practice standpoint, it, which is contract transactional oriented, is like a whole different thing. It's not taught in law school. It's a synthesis process. It's not a legal process. Um, so um, I've always been involved with entrepreneurial things and new things. And so Fabian and I converged on one of those. And, um, you know, he and I, both shared a recognition that um, the world was going to hell in a handbasket and the way we were approaching fixing that wasn't working. Like if we want a different result, we better do this differently. Yeah, exactly. So um, we really sort of, endeavored to get to the core ingredients, like the, the most simple reduced ingredients of human inaction and generativity. Like everything that we're facing was created by the hand of man. It's our work. Yes. Um, and the industrial cultural setup um, what is, is fundamentally anti-human and the financial fiat currency banking finance sector is fundamentally domineering and extractive and uh, relates to people as commodities and resources. So um, if we're going to change the result, we have to change how we're doing us as generative, as the responsible parties. And we kept digging sort of further and further back to how we do us. Awesome. And we shed industrial language. We shed the assumptions and imprinted, encoded belief systems about what is and isn't okay, what you can and can't do, what you have to have or, or, or uh, require in order to. And all there's just so much stuff that comes trippingly out of the mouths of people in the our communities oh, yeah. that are that come out as like hard concrete 
but you have to, there is, there's like all of these things that are like as fixed as stone in the, in this expression that aren't, they're not required unless you choose to invite them to the party. It's like, you know, no realer than fiat currency actually having any kind of value, intrinsic value. It doesn't, it's a fiction. <laughs> <laughs> right so um the unlearning was like is that real or is that industrial no that's industrial we don't let's put that aside let's get rid of that let's get rid of that let's get rid of that and you know get down to a blank sheet of paper and so the first thing that we landed on because our initial focus was very um, was very rubber meets the road focused on the following logic. The biggest defenders, the Darth Vader's of the industrial thing are the large multinational corporations. And if you wanted to affect the fastest um, reduction in continued damage, continued extraction, continued harm, um, target them and transform them. And okay, so we know the target. Now, and the minute you go large multinational corporation and transformation, everybody goes, that's impossible. <laughs> and that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> However, everybody that's been in that business and that's sold them course and program and framework and workbooks and, and ropes courses and whatever and whatever and whatever going back, you know, a century um, was very expressive about their frustration of going in, spending two weeks in a room with 25 people and everybody and filling the walls with pictures and everybody getting on the same wavelength and it being brilliant and extraordinary and then walking out and not ending up having any kind of sustained effect because it died. It wasn't, it, it didn't persist. So we were like, got to do that differently. So blank sheet of paper, what does different look like to transform a major large multinational corporation? So first of all, we have to come up with a pitch that is sellable, that, you know, a, not, not the enlightened, open-minded, you know, not crossing the chasm you know, innovative end of the bell curve, but the the troglodyte industrial eight you know eighteen nineties minded CEO of the largest, biggest, gnarliest industrial. Like, what's the lowest, hardest target? You know, hanging fruit. Like, we've got to come up with something that that guy potentially would buy. Yeah. And um, as a conceit in the Renaissance sense of the term, right? So it has to be a narrative that is non-threatening. It has to be a narrative that seems to potentially have an upside. It has to be a relatively cheap thing and low demand, low load, and um, nothing to lose. No potential downside or adverse impact or effect if it doesn't work in the magic in the business of magic pill sales to corporations of consulting services. And so we came up with the following. <laughs> uh, Fabian had something. You're muted yeah. though. Yes. What I wanted to share is that we also reframe ourselves. Um, uh, we didn't design a pitch, but uh, we were thinking about uh, become catalysts of that transformation. And so we wouldn't be selling any proprietary model or we wouldn't be prescribing anything. And so we were more pool oriented rather than push oriented. So that was part of our transformation, our, our own individual transformation as well. Just yeah. wanted to add that thought. Yeah, it had to be, we're not selling anything. 
<laughs> yes, and I would just draw the corollary between this as well. This is a pull way. I'm like, okay, you guys are neat. <laughs> <laughs> well, and 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 you're here, and we're and we're having this unbelievable opportunity. Organic. It's an organic emergence. There were no dark arts involved. Industrial dark arts. There's no coercion, persuasion, manipulation, you know, uh, incentivization, none of the, we're not selling anything. We're not selling anything. So we were really clear that we had to live and be the transformed agents that we were hoping to achieve help them achieve for themselves. So we, 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 we sort of came up with a, uh, a set of principles. One, um, whatever the process is, they have to co-create it or they won't own it. So it has to be internally self-generated. Two, we need a vehicle, but we need to be catalysts in the purest sense of the word, which means, no, we don't, we don't carry any constraint or limitation or authority or power or control. And, and that means all of the traditional leadership stuff, which is power, facilitation, which is power. Um, we, we, got to, we got down to the point that my doing something for you is actually has power in it, carries power in it, as opposed to me serving you. That's a, a Grand Canyon difference that nobody is even thinking about. So if you're going to, if we're going to step out of power, authority, paradigms, industrial paradigms, we have to really do this in a completely different way. No cheating. Um, it's got to be, it's got to be the real deal. So, so the conceit we came up with is um, you're the CEO and you have a, a mission statement on your website or a values statement or whatever. Every single company has that what they stand for, what they believe in, or the good that they believe they're doing by the world. And none of them are in alignment with it. <laughs> the truth and the, 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 the PR, like there's a huge gulf. So you have this statement on your website. We're now in the age of transparency. We're in the age of authenticity. We're in the age of relationship. It's gotta be real and substantive and all that stuff. And so, we offer helping you do a values audit. You've got your explicit statement. Then you have a public perception of your values, which is a direct correlation to your results and, and impacts, effects, and contributions to the world, good, bad, or indifferent. And then you have the tacit understanding of your values from your employees internally. And so if you do a process of auditing all of that and getting a really clear picture of the delta between what you say your, your values are, and we take you at your word that you would like that to be your values, and what the world and your people really think of your values, that if we can surface, help your people surface that gulf, then you can bring it into alignment and potentially, you know, get on track and be true to the, the expression you've made about what you want to be. Now, to the most primitive CEO on the, you know, on the most reduced and simplistic terms, the minimum benefit would be a PR win. Look what we're doing to realign ourselves, to clean ourselves up, right? Just as a narrative. Um, to an enlightened and sophisticated guy, there's a much deeper story. 
So the the impact, the transformative power and impact of this starts literally from the negotiate the terms of our retainer, because 100% of this is going to be based on internal resources and internal people and internal budget, internal everything that you already have. You don't have to buy anything. No platform, no services, no software, no hardware, no, not, no nothing. You don't need anything. You got everything you need. Um, we're going to need a team of people as the starting point, the seed crystal. Um, and in order to do this, those people, if they say yes, if tapped and they say yes, have to be assured job security, have to be assured no loss of vested benefits, seniority, whatever, whatever, whatever. So if this ends or fails, they're not they, they experience no risk or loss for coming to do this as opposed to the jobs they're currently in. They have to have a blank check. Now the task they're charged with is going to be completely based on internal resources, but they need to be able to have call on those resources to do what you're tasking them to do, which is the values audit. And um, they have to be authorized in an unqualified way, which means they answer to nobody, they report to nobody. Their task is to execute, period. And they, the only people they answer to are themselves. No second guessing, no qualifying their authority, their power, their judgment. They figure it out. Yes. They make it happen. So all of that in the agri, and this is where the lawyer in me is pressed into service of meeting the needs of a group to evolve into a whole new place internally in that company. Yeah. It's creating safety, security, eliminating risk, and giving them true self-determination um, uh, and, and authority and enfranchisement and power. Awesome. Right? So what's the real deal here? What we're really doing is we're planting a seed crystal. That team is a seed crystal. And in order to do the audit, they have to connect with every single employee in the company. And in order to do that, they have to press the existing infrastructure and technology and whatever into service to create a communications net and a sensing net and a response, a, 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 a two-directional and group capacity to do this. Right. So what's the future that you <laughs> pushing towards? Because... There's obviously like there's and there's a lot to digest with both of what you've shared so far. And I know that it's like, whew, uh, it's it's hard to um, compress decades of work into just a few minutes. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, vision for the future in terms of the implications of this work. Well, so let me take I, I think it's about I, where I'm not sure where we're at time wise. We're, we're are we out. Are we done? <laughs> Almost at the hour. Um, okay. And maybe I can just quickly check in with both of your timings. Well, I'm, I'm yours, um, you know, on the back end of this. I'm, I, I have more flexibility and room to run. Fabian is more constrained. Yes, I may have uh, like 15 minutes more. Okay. Okay. So I, I think in 10 minutes, I can really sort of give you what that led to. That was the beginning. Mm -hmm. What that led to was, okay, great, corporation, context-specific and bounded and, you know, an approach, different, different approach. 
as catalysts, we're upstream of all the people that have brilliance and facilitation and help and products and stuff to sell that could help the people in that room to do what they have to do. But we're upstream of all of them, but we are catalysts for creating, driving demand for them. How does this relate to the world? Like how do we, you know, so turn the telescope around. Yeah. So all the systems in the world are breaking down. The Federal Reserves of the world are actually bankrupt. The banks that are riding on the back of them are bankrupt. The countries that are riding on the back of the banks are bankrupt. Everybody's out of money. It's the whole thing is like this huge illusion. Government systems are fail, failing. You know, that the Trump is even where he is, is a, a huge billboard of like, that's, that's broken. That ain't working. Um, religions are failing. They're scrambling to figure out what's, what's the new business model. Um, everybody is staring, you know, uh, a failure of the status quo um, in just about every dimension without any idea how to deal with that other than just to keep putting one foot in front of the other doing what they've always done. We anchor and root everything that we've come up with in nature because nature really has got it going on. Like in Nate, there aren't bosses in nature. There aren't leadership in nature. There's none of the industrial stuff that we've cooked up and imposed on ourselves in nature. It's just like, isn't part of the mix. It just works. Especially when it's not screwed around with and damaged the way we've been damaging it. So we, our values, from a human being centered, what are our values? It's human being centered first, values centered second as the, the mediating influence of whatever human beings enact. And then in service to commons, it's not, it's not about competition. We're all in the same boat. It's all of us or none of us, one for all, all for one, which means Whatever the solution is, it's got to include everybody. And when I say everybody, I don't mean everybody who is part of the digital elite, everybody that has internet <laughs> uh, and a Starbucks on the corner, or everybody that has a cell phone. I mean everybody, refugees on the border of Burma and Pakistan who are currently, like, it's insane. And, and everybody. So the challenge, this is one of the projects in our project garden. One of the, cha the, the challenge, the call to action is what if we were to convene a Manhattan Project group of companies, individuals, resources to tackle the following challenge. How can we affect an awakening enfranchisement connection and innervation of a global engagement of every human being on this planet? on internet viral, at internet viral speeds, bottom up, bottom up. Can you we have, we have all the technology resources to do what I just said, to have every single person connected, every single person capable of playing and participating and contributing. We have the means to do that right now, today. Already, it exists, it exists. One question, what's the Manhattan Project? The Manhattan Project was the project of the United States government that was launched in the middle of World War II that created the atomic bomb to end the war. So, but what does it mean? It's, it's to bring... It's, it's a marshalling of people, companies, resources around a single 
goal okay. on an unprecedented, intense, blank check, whatever it takes. When the Manhattan Project was created, a cor uh, 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 I think he was a corporal in the Army was charged with gathering the top physicists in the world to split the atom, to, to figure out how to create an atomic bomb to end the war. And it was an unprecedented, in, in the 40s, I think it was the equivalent of a billion dollar project. It was just massive. And it was in a very condensed period of time. That's the, but the only generativity, by the way, that has happened historically in that way has been in service to war and killing people. We need to do that in service to saving our planet. I'd like, to, <laughs> I, I, I'll just throw in there that I'd like to declare a war. A war on stupid. <laughs> I don't want to do war with stupid. I Nothing. just want I just want to render it unnecessary. Exactly. <laughs> like in terms of in terms of what, you know, obviously I'm not a warmonger. Um, but to use the industrial language and to tend to poke you and trigger you guys a little bit with your unlearning, <laughs> um, the level of stupid that we are faced with is so viscerally obvious to the regular person there's a there's a case for this war on stupid just saying <laughs> i hear you i hear you i but do i do i engage in that war and feed that from an energy attention time and attention investment standpoint from a generative standpoint or would i rather just generate the cure like manifest and enact the cure that's sort of reactively where we got to yes like, I don't have to, I'm not concerned with the bad stuff. There are lots of people doing that. And I hugely value all of the work, all of the energy being directed there. We're additive. We're, we're paradigmatically additive, we yeah. believe, right? So human inaction is a function of time and attention. If it's not value, if it's values mediated, and as long as the thought, the word, and the action are all in alignment, no force in the universe can stop that from manifesting. Fix the values, thought, words, and actions in alignment, and we're in business. Activate, enable, and 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 serve, and 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 support every individual on the planet. Joining that undertaking as a generative human being and we'll fix this really quickly fabian yes i just wanted to interject that uh, for completing that picture uh, we need also uh, people who jump into that generativity field to do some unlearning themselves and also to uh, detaching from their ego because <laughs> The higher their ego is, the less contribution they make to that generative field, right? And then uh, the benefit that is emerging in, the, in that field, uh, we uh, consider that is more experiential value. So it's the value that they experience in that field. So we have devices uh, for fun, just a formula for that. But <laughs> uh, it, uh, it, it is uh, like, like that. Uh, it's time, it's attention, it's values aligned, it's ego detached, and also it's experiential within the, the uh, let's say, the constraints uh, or the boundaries of a specific action and goal-oriented gen generativity field that people may jump into having meaningful and gener generative conversations like this one, right? Yes, absolutely. And I want to touch on the, on the humility that you talked about right at the very beginning, Fabian. Um, yes. Because the truth is, is this is big. Um, and when we wrestle with some of these really huge planetary scale, potentially, you know, universal scale questions, uh, there's, there's a real power that runs through us that, yeah, we can be like, oh my God, this is the idea that's going to change the everything. And, and I think that that, 
that uh, inspiration is really important, but the balance of what that does to us in terms of persons who have egos, uh, I think it's, it's really important for us to have our mind on that because none of us can do this in a vacuum. Um, none of us are going to be perfect at it. Um, and we need to be able to, uh, to recognize when we have those egoic blips where, and, and be able to hold space for the bigness of it, as well as our little human frailties and foibles within that. So I just really wanted to, to bring that because this is big, right? Yeah. Um, and we think we think so, but we've been working, you know, we've been in the workshop for three years. We, we have no idea, like, whether people will get this and whether they think it, it, it makes sense as a, as a, as sort of an orientation and shift. But, you know, to this, to the point you just made, we're firm believers in the idea of unconditional love as the source medium. And unconditional love doesn't mean I love you the way I want to love you. It means I love you in the way you want to be loved. And if we're going to include, you know, 10 billion people, then the vision of this, the technology affordances and, and, and supports and systems to serve the human beings in that need to have awareness on, an in, on a granular level in terms of what do you want or need supporting you in the doing of this, wherever you are, whatever your affordances and resources or lack thereof are, it's about serving. It's about the machines in service to human beings, not human beings working in service to the machines. And you turn that telescope around and it really interesting stuff starts to surface about what is required. My awareness of you and who you are and how you receive information and, um, and what your capacities and limitations are and um, and there are layers and we've actually like hardened up a lot of this. So. Yes. And I think that uh, in, in a forthcoming conversation, when uh, we have the chance of showing Tommy, our beta version of our website, then you are going to see that the way we are uh, asking people to introduce themselves uh, is much deeper than just name, email, email address, address. and then your avatar and that <laughs> it's, it's a much deeper ask if they want to be members of our community to show really who they are in, in very different facets of their beings not only uh, what they do but what their attitudes are what what their preference when interacting and collaborating are and other stuff that we are asking them uh, of course, that's voluntary for them to, to share. It's not compulsory, but we have designed it that way in order to know themselves uh, deeper as human beings, not only, and, and so we can cutter them in the way that they like to be cuttered, uh, yes. not being just pushing something, uh, let's say, 4T-like, but customizing their preferences uh, in many, many different facets. Just wanted to share that. Wonderful. So uh, I'm noting that we're getting close to close. Uh, what I would love to do is to share a piece of poetry that I wrote that kind of shares a little bit more about me and where I'm coming from. It's a creative expression, um, but just in terms of having all of what's uh, rather than telling my story, I'll just share this little piece of, of um, it's not so little, it's about six minutes. Do you have six minutes, Fabian? Okay. Uh, so the, I, I wrote this in 2000. So it was at a, at a moment where I was deeply motivated to understand how I could contribute. And it was, uh, I 
I realized that I had about a day and a half to write a piece that was coming through. Uh, so it hasn't, it hasn't changed since, since I wrote it, uh, but I'd love to share it for you right now. I'm forever on the bead of wonder. I love that feeling that I get when I see something that reminds me of the mystery. I love the myths, those echoes down the corridors of time that couch cultural ricochets. I love that soft and malleable place where it can all be true, where there are little fiefdoms of thought that coexist naturally, like the caterpillar couldn't possibly know what the oak's full wisdom is, but it realizes that it has some because it exists, because it is. I wanna know things, but I wonder if it's our addiction as a race to figure it all out, nail it down, <laughs> dissect it, stamp out the mystery before it comes in the night with shroud or fangs. It's like our Linus blank blanket of knowledge keeps us safe from the profundity of our world. But there's something about being naked, adrift in the sea of creation, bumping into the world naturally within chaos that is so incredibly freeing and allowing. All possibilities exist within this place. From this place, I have a sense of reverence for all things. And I don't have to presume to know anything. I guess I'm hopeful about our world, where we're going, what we're doing, partly because it seems rare and partly because it seems necessary. Without vision, there will merely be a continuation of the slippery slide down the slope of the 13 families and the oil cartels. I guess I'm hopeful because the alternative is to tie my hands and feet while I watch wide-eyed screaming while the train wreck occurs. I have power. I can think, talk, act, do, write, do podcasts. All these can be used to help change the world. One mind at a time. One action at a time. One moment at a time. I'm inspired. I look around me and I see so many talented people. So much potential within us. And though I've been terrified of what this life will require of me, I know that I must move forward in my way to find ways to get quiet and discover what role I need to play today. I see that we need to build bridges of concept that are not static or fixed, but open and freeing. Not those concepts that start at the edges and work inward, but rather those that start somewhere in the middle and move outward. We've developed rationality to the point where we're simply bursting at the seams of its limitation of us. Rational thinking, though neat and clean, does not speak to the whole of us. Emotional is not rational, and neither is spiritual. Rationale is to the life force what a picture of a tree is to a tree. We are perceptual tools and our perceptions have been dominated by that which can be seen. We have looked, seen, named, and presumed to have known these things that we see because we've had the audacity to have named them with our childish pointed finger. Have you really looked at a snail lately? Its spiral house, its sticky little feelers, traveling in the same world as us, living its life. We hold ourselves above these things, presupposing that we are not of them, nor they of us. This is an error in thinking. This ties one hand behind our back, while the other is bound by the language within which we conceptualize these things. How can we trust a language whereby the word that we use to come to knowing is to understand? To stand under what? How about overstand or equistand? This is a foundational word and it speaks a kind of hierarchical because we said, I don't want to accept by rote. And why do we all have to agree anyway? We will never be able to homogenize this world and truly what a shame if we did. 
the awe that I feel when I think that no snowflake is exactly the same as any other is that same sense of expansive resting of my mind in the place where the possibilities simply boggle. And then us, we are profound, so much potential. We've thought of ourselves as top of the food chain, this munching chewer of all else below us, when we're meant to be stewards of this earth. We've been islands of rights, fighting, when we really need to carry the mantle of our responsibility. In this moment, each now that we experience, we have the power of choice to dream this world again, to create a new, to take the best of what has been, to fashion a future unfathomable, diverse, open-ended, and remarkable. To do that, we not, need not do what they tell us, whoever they are, but rather each of us dream, delve into our passions, look around us, see what needs doing. There's tons. It takes discernment, reflection, and self-responsibility to figure a path, out a path that melds our abilities and our passions with what's required. We are stewards of this earth. Each one of us, everyone, has unique abilities and a world within which to express them. These are our tools. We need to match tools to need, creating a living sculpture of human solutions. We need to honor our elders and our children, encouraging them to give their gifts of wisdom and inspiration. Each one of us needs to have the courage to look in the mirror and ask, what can I do? That's the piece. Thank you. Love that. <laughs> Thank you. So this is a we, and we're all in that place, right? And I'm really honored to have met you both, and I'm really excited to see where our collaboration is going to take us and what we can learn from each other and, and kick the tires on and make better. And I'm just really deeply grateful for both of you to meet today. And thank you for this opportunity. This is really huge. And your time and attention, the generative sort of power, the catalytic power of creating this um, is really big deal for us. And, um, and we, you know, we've, we're, we've just managed to create the thinnest first sort of complete picture as a beginning we need so there's so much room for input and help and contribution and enrichment and we're open source like in everything we're doing it's about an invitation not a uh not a thing mm -hmm. it's a it's a space and an, and a field and a um and we hope sort of a seed crystal yes well, I'm happy to support, uh, and I, I see and feel uh, a lot of alignment in terms of our core ways of doing and being, and I'm really grateful to have an opportunity to learn from you guys and grow and help to support this greater emergence. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any final words, Fabian? Well, I am also very honored and uh, thankful uh, for for this conversation of what can be filled all all the feelings that even the distance are are flowing right now the emotions and feelings so i really thank you for your for your last piece uh, it was moving um uh, also enlightening <laughs> and uh, we are always open to share uh, we are commons uh, so Yes. Uh, we are always open to uh, think together and to enact together and it doesn't matter where is the field located but there is a field 
where things could happen. So these are my my final reflections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it feels like we have uh, planted a crystal seed in our uh, collaboration today. So thank you. Anything for a final word, uh, Doug? Um, just I'm really happy. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and excited at what you bring and very curious about what you think and what comes up for you and what um, um, you'll make emerge as we sort of, you know, go further, go deeper. Um, it's a really, in our world in space and universe, um, having another person is like, this a really powerful, you know, thing. Just as an idea, it's like a, a another generator, another contributor, another mind, and another awareness. And um, it's it's not um, it's ex it's an exponential function in our universe, not a linear one. So this is a really big deal, and. I'm really happy. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. I feel like there's a, there's a really beautiful coming together here. Um, and then just mind boggling to think of our, com our community, our peers, our community members and, and everything that is brought by everyone. Uh, so we start with our seed and, uh, and yeah, thank you. I have so much gratitude to be here and to be with you both and that you're willing to play in this space. And uh, so we'll do a short checkout, but for now, uh, thank you so much. And until next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.